Sunny Leia at the library here, and this evening is a co-production of the Bud Werner Memorial Library, the Community Agriculture Alliance, and Trenton Pioneers Museum. And um, Trenton Pioneers is actually taping this evening for their archives, so uh, that's what's going on over here. Um, Katie, thank you right here. Um, I just want to, um, on behalf of the library, thank our always wonderful and amazing partners, the Ag Alliance and Trend. We love doing stuff with these groups. We love local history and the chance to um, learn and engage like this at the library. So thanks for coming out and supporting everybody in this effort. Um, I also want to give a huge thanks to Paul and Ellen Bonfield, who have made a pop-up museum for us tonight, and you absolutely should um, take time after um, the panel this evening to come up here, check out some of these really cool um, old tools and saddles and all kinds of things. Um, they've got great information um, about all items there, and Paul and Ellen are here to chat. Come on, me. <laughs> No shortage of stories there as well. And um, I'm going to tell you um, real quick um, two, uh, two quick local agriculture things going on this week. One, um, on behalf of the library, the Bud Warner Seed Block Seed Library is um, open for business. So anybody who's still looking for gardening seeds, we have lots and lots of um, non-GMO, open-pollinated uh, seeds up there on the second floor, and they're there for the taking with your library card. Um, the other thing and uh, that I wanted to mention is that um, tomorrow's Ag Week event is also here in Library Hall. Um, it will be Dr. Whitney Crenshaw and his amazing insects. Um, a talk about um, landscaping for insects or not, and um, he's here tonight. Back row. <laughs> so come back tomorrow night. Um, another great, great, great program. He's going to be working with the Master Gardeners all day tomorrow, and then we get him tomorrow night. So um, with that, thanks for coming out. I'm going to pass it over to um, Candice from Shed Pioneers, and then she's going to turn you over to Marsha with Community Ag Alliance, who will be our fearless moderator with this wonderful panel that we have tonight. So thanks a lot. this week also for Ag Week. Um, at the end of the week on Friday, March 27th, we're doing Rugged Ranch Women Talk with Marsha Dunbach and Diane Holly is going to be a great talk at the museum at noon, so hopefully you can make it as part of the Ag Week celebration. And then also we just opened uh, in our Foundations of Steamboat exhibit, uh, an exhibit on the Simiton family, a long, long ranching family in the valley. So if you haven't gotten a chance to check out this exhibit, we hope that you'll come and check it out. It will be on display through February 2015. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we are uh, taking this for our archive. This is obviously, you can see by this panel, an incredible opportunity to record oral history, which is one of the major aspects of what we do at the museum. So for some reason you can't uh, you have somebody that couldn't attend, please do send them to the museum and this talk will be on file for that in the archive. And then in addition, I wanted to mention this incredible exhibit that Jenny talked about that the Bonnefields put together. Many of these objects you will see again, relive, in the museum for our next exhibit that will be opening in June that's all about the horse, the bond and the enduring uh, dependence that we've had in Brown County on the, on the horse. And so you'll get to see these items and more that will be opening um, in mid-June. That exact date hasn't been set. So anyway, I just wanted to thank all of our partners, thank Marsha, the Ag Alliance, and the museum for um, getting this whole week together. And we'll just be so proud of these partners. So thank you. Thank you.
big poster that's laying on the floor. It was done a few years ago for cultural heritage tourism. Unfortunately, somebody tried to set fire to it, so we couldn't actually use it anywhere. But being my father's daughter, I couldn't throw it out. And so it, it's laying here, and it's got some great information on it as well. This panel is really a super duper thing. I'm so excited, I can't wait. I'm not going to talk very long. I'm going to turn it over immediately to Rita Harold, who is a native of Route County, uh, living in the South Route area. And we've asked Rita to speak for a little bit this evening on the role of ranch women. So Rita, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, the first thing, she limited me on my time. <laughs> How could I possibly shorten it down to that length of time? <laughs> Uh, my family came into Rapp County in the 1880s. Uh, the first part of them came in in about 1882 or 83. Uh, some of them came in in 1885, some of them in 1887. And then the latecomers came in in 1911. So my family has been here for a good while. And as far as the ranch women go, it's hard to stop and, and think what they really did and what they would do. Many of those first settlers that came in were either, uh, had fought in the Civil War or else they were sons of people who had fought there. When those husbands and sons left to fight in the war, the women had to make their own decisions back where they were. So when they came on to this area in the 1880s, a lot of those women were very independent. Um, some of them actually even homesteaded in their own names. And more than a person would think. Some that I can think of right off the top of my head that homesteaded in the south end of the county were Louise Pitcock, Bertha Moore and May Perry, and I'm sure there were probably others that I haven't heard about. But with that thought in mind, I'm going to uh, introduce some of my family through a poem that I wrote several years ago. Um, it's the first four generations that had lived on our ranch. First from Missouri, then to the Divide. There are a few years, then on on where they would finally abide, with Robert and sons, Walter and Ben, on horses with Rob, Francis and the others, on a wagon that she would drive. Francis on the wagon seat, reins in her hands. This wagon was hers to command, weeks on the road, finally the county of Rock, keeping a house for a family of ten, Standing behind her, seen like a sin. Doing the chores, cooking, washing, ironing. To rest meant sitting and darning. Each child had a chore to do as well. Wash the dishes. There's no time to dwell. But to every child in his own time, she taught this rock. Come, butter, come. Come, butter, come. Molly's at the gate, waiting on the sweet butter cake. Bertha was now a woman full grown, was taking care of a house and a home of her own. Chores each day, gathering eggs, planting the seeds, feeding the lambs and pulling the weeds. Several families would take the wagon and go up on Green Ridge and stay a week or so. It would be a party, a picnic, cooking on an open fire, camping out, picking raspberries, boiling them down, putting them in jars, day in and day out. Back home again, with plenty of jam, get ready for winter. Will there be enough ham? Cook breakfast, dinner, and supper. Don't forget to feed the ducks. But it's not all work. Time to play cards. They lost. Oh, shucks. The men are in the field, 
hard-boiled eggs to send me in the lunch. Need the bread. The biscuits are already eaten. What a bunch. Get the cream from out of the milk house. Don't splatter it on your new blouse. Her son wants to go out to play, run up to the neighbors on this fine summer's day. But it's Saturday morning and the weekly chore to churn the butter before he goes out the door. Come butter come, come butter come. Molly's at the gate waiting on a sweet butter cake. Gladys was the next French wife, we all agree. She had married into the family, you see. She in turn cooked and cleaned and fed the chickens. Her dinners and suppers had all the fixes. In the summer, to the hayfield she would go, driving the plunger on the stacker with the old white truck. Oh, so slow. Next came the Ford. The steering wheel with ease would turn. To push the hay to the front or back, she would learn. Drive to the store and get the mail. She was willing to go. This new car was kind of fun, you know. But in her turn, she would pour the cream into that churn. Come, butter, come. Come, butter, come. Molly's at the gate, waiting on a sweet butter cake. I too am on the ranch with the sheep, horses, and cows. Animals I enjoy, though we no longer have sows. Pushing the animals to summer range, to some seems quite strange. Haying is still a summertime event. Now we use a hemp, hay hook, all strangely bent. Driving a tractor, pulling a rake, or going to mow, no longer are these tasks extremely slow. My life has changed. Everything has been rearranged. I drive an hour to teach a class. Will the students even pass? <laughs> Though I still look back and remember Perhaps it was in September, sitting on that old kitchen chair as a kid, using the churn with that handmade wooden lid. Come, butter, come, come, butter, come. Molly's at the gate, waiting on the sweet butter cake. Come, butter, come, come, butter, come. And I think I'll let that go for now. We'll go ahead with the rest of it. Marcia? Thank you, Rita. That gives you just a little taste of what some of the ranch women do in this community. And how we're going to handle this this evening is we're going to let all five of the panelists speak, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A so that you can ask whatever you would like to. And um, we, uh, unfortunately, most of the panelists, well, at least four of them have pointed out to me that I did not have any liquor or beer at this event. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be able to talk. But I can guarantee you won't be able to shut them up. Yes. Does anybody know what this is that's sitting up here? No. <laughs> <Or is it? laughs> it's a cream can. Um, and Dean, who is also a Rock County native out of the Elk River Valley, is uh, actually from one of the old dairy families that was in this area. And so he's going to visit with us a little bit about the, uh, the ranching perspective, the, the dairy perspective uh, that he grew up with. Also, before he does speak, I'd like everybody to uh, give Dean a big round of applause. Today is his birthday. Jamie <laughs> with the library has ordered a big chocolate cake. And we'd like to invite everybody to stay afterwards and, and enjoy it with Dean. So Dean, could you tell us a little bit about the dairy industry? Well, to start with, that's a cream can, not a milk can. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a milk can, not a cream can. <laughs> cream cans were the five-gallon cans. Uh, we would, uh, with our dairy, we'd put out about eight of those a day. 
with these ten gallon cans. And we run Holstein cattle. There were six dairies up the Up River Valley. There was uh, us, Carol Harvey, Mike Mosier, Bedell's, Toffley's, and Whippers up in the Clark area. And uh, I think out here on River Road, there's Simmons. And uh, on down 40, there was uh, more Selby. And that was basically all the, the dairies that were here at the time we did. We sold the milk to uh, Selch Dairy. Selch Dairy finally sold out to the Moff County Creamery. And uh, later on, when they were wanting bulk tanks, wanted us to drive out, drive out the cows. All the stuff we got together with everybody in the group, and uh, we decided to trade our Holstein cows for beef cows from Sinan. And Sinan put a big dairy up down uh, Moffat County. And that was about the end of the milk, and I, the milking is uh, twice a day, every day, no matter what's going on. <laughs> Our dad, uh, he told, he would tell us, when I holler, you boys' feet better hit the floor. So he would go down and start the furnace, and then the uh, kitchen stove about 4, 4.30 in the morning, and put him on a pot of coffee, and he'd drink three or four cups of coffee, and then he'd holler at us, and then we'd head for the barn. And uh, we knew better when he did holler, we, our feet did hit the floor. <laughs> And uh, on Milton, it was, uh, we got to where it didn't bother us a bit to break the cows to milk. It was a cows to kick at and whatnot. Now, Orville and them, I think he would rather break horses. But it, it scared me to break a horse, but it never scared me any to break a cow. <laughs> and we used the cows when they kicked at us. We had an old cow that sat next to the barn door. We call her the old kicking cow. And we'd just jump past her. And Mom, I think we had her trained to kick, and Mom would uh, critique us a little bit on that. <laughs> and then about 1930, when we got rid of the cattle, and then we started in with the Angus cows. And the beef breeds at that time were mainly shorthorn, Angus. There wasn't very many, mostly shorthorn and Hereford. And then dairy cows and dairy cow mixes. The only large Angus herd I know of was uh, by Barbie up at the home ranch. Not the home ranch, but the association ranch. And uh, he had his own sale barn. Everything, there wasn't too many people bought Angus cows at that time, except maybe put on heifers or something. And, then later on in the 70s, the exotics come in, and I got into that. I had an artificial insemination. I took a course on that and had a tank, and I got semen of every breed going. And I had several neighbors critique me on some of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I had some key in any that they could jump any fence they had as good as they all could. So I learned the hard way, and now I would say the two breeds that's most prominent in the country is probably the, I guess it's the same breed, but the red Angus and the black Angus are <coughs> most prominent. Uh, in the old days, we the Bill Sherrod, Dutch, uh, Dutch Martin, it was uh, Perry Clark had them before Bill Sherrod was there. And, uh, and Ralph Belton and Guire had, you see, Ralph had short horns and uh, Ralph Guire was supposed to have milking short horns. But Ralph Belton would always claim that the milking short horn was the calls out of the beef short horn. <laughs> so that would, stir up, that would stir up a few arguments. And uh, I don't know, uh, getting the cattle to market was another problem. Uh, back when we were teenagers, they had the big drives even before we were teenagers. 
they'd start out up the Snake River, and uh, by the time they'd get down to our place, there'd be five, six hundred head of cattle in the drive, and they'd drive them all down to the Gold Depot down here where they had a set of stockyards. And the men would usually spend a week in there sorting brands and getting the cattle all sorted out and whatnot, which I imagine there was a few arguments on that. But I can remember cattle running wild up over the graveyard, and, uh, and they sent us kids up there running out of the tombstones and whatnot. But then the biggest job was probably getting them to cross the Yampa River. That's the reason they finally put the stock bridge up which uh, Stockbridge was uh, where most of the teenage boys settled their disputes. <laughs> you would know me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Junior would know me. <laughs> and that's, well, that's about all I can say on the beef on the cattle. reference to a number of families that are represented here tonight and if he may if you called out your family would you please stand Gilbert Anderson I heard you mention your granddad Mike Mosier and your son is here well um, and no, Tyler too uh, Earl Waddell is sitting here now you folks I don't know who how are you connected you're with 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 boy they, your family group <laughs> All I'm of you? I'm curious. Well, glad to see you. Last time I saw you, I was young. <laughs> <laughs> and Jackie Grimaldi uh, was a sheriff. Or Jackie, she still is. Sorry, Jackie, she is. And then Earl Goodell. You can stand. <laughs> um, also, Dean's daughter, Tina, is here. Now, is there anybody else that uh, he's, he mentioned? Okay, thank you. We appreciate you guys being here. Okay, we heard a little bit about the beef industry. Dean, that was great. For someone that doesn't like talking to public, you did okay. <laughs> uh, but now we're going to turn it over to someone that thrives on targeting the public, and that is our one of our ex-extension ex agents, one of our former, really pretty, pretty privileged here tonight to have three generations of extension agents sitting in front of you. That would be C or, uh, Sam Haslam, and then he was followed by C.J. Maclow, who is now followed by Todd Havenbill. But Sam is an expert on not only the sheep industry here, but around the state and around the nation. And so he's going to give us a little bit of background on how important the sheep industry has been in our valley. Sam? Well, I grew up on a cattle ranch. The way I got through college is when I was born in 1930, Dad brought in a heifer calf for me. And that was money was to go in the bank, and all of her progeny was to get me through college. And by golly, it did. I didn't even have a bicycle in college, and I sure didn't have a car. I didn't get a car when I was 22 years old in the, in the service then. But uh, that was, times were hard in those days, and that's the way that we saved for a college education plan. He did the same thing for my younger brother, who was born two years after I, had, I was, and uh, so on. I grew up on Blue Mountain, Moffat County, West End of Moffat County. Our deeded land and, and range went right to Utah, Colorado border. We summered our cattle in Colorado and we wintered them in Utah. We had at one time a 525 head BLM permit on the desert in the winter, seven miles plus or minus below Jensen down the river. And uh, so we had neighbors that were sheep people. And I want to salute some of the sheep people and some men that I'm gonna mention that maybe you didn't like. But <laughs> anyway, a lot of the early sheep men who came to Northwest Colorado 
were of Greek descent. We can think of the Perus family and the Theus family and the Sinus family and uh, Papoulos, Jim Papoulos, and so on. And most of these guys that are around now are second or third generation from the old country. In fact, Steve Simons, who was Jim Simons' father, Jim owned Cashway and Craig for many years. He was a direct from the old country, and he didn't speak the very best English, but he got his point across, because you didn't get ahead of Steve. He was quite a character and a go-getter. But the west end of Moffat County didn't walk sheep on Blue Mountain. Blue Mountain essentially starts uh, at the Green River and comes east to Elk Springs. Yeah, Elk Springs is about the east end of Blue Mountain. It's one of the few mountains in the Rocky Mountains that goes east and west. A fellow by the name of Darnell, D-E-R-N-A-L, bragged that he would get sheep on Blue Mountain and make a success out of it. I don't know whether the people that put an end to it were from right here or farther up the valley or so on. <laughs> but one night they, he brought those sheep up from the community of Dinosaur, essentially that area, trailed them up onto the mountain and he had that herd of sheep there on the mountain. We're just pretty much above the K Ranch. The K Ranch is right on the Utah Colorado State Line. And way back when Route and Moffat County were one county, Tom Morgan, who owned the K Ranch, was county sheriff. And you can go to the sheriff's office and see a picture of Tom Morgan. And when he was a quite an old man, he used to come and visit with my dad there at the Tarkow Camp on the North. Well, needless to say, this fellow by the name of Darnell, he cut those sheep on the mountain. He had a Mexican herder with him, and I don't know what the herder's name was, but they were camped right at the upper end of the cedars in the area called Buckwater. And that's right where the paved road goes up from Dinosaur from the headquarters over the top of the mountain, and you can go off into Pat's Hole that way. He was awakened one night wondering what was going on because there was shooting going on and so he went right out of the front of his tent, this is Darnell, and was, had his gun up over a rock and whoever was on the other side of the rock had a pretty powerful rifle. The bullet went in Darnell's hair and came out down where he sat down and of course that ended Darnell. <laughs> the Utah sheriff came to investigate, and really he had no authority in Colorado. The Mexican sheep herder, he went all through the cedars, he was no dummy, and he hot-footed it down to the K Ranch, and then they went and got the sheriff from Uinta County. I know where that person was, Darnell, was killed. Uh, I'm one of the few people alive. Maybe the only one that does know where that is, but I am going to take some people before I expire and show where the sheep herder was killed. They never did really figure out who did that, but some of the ranchers down by Juniper Hot Springs, which is east of Mayville, southeast, said that just about daylight there were some cowboys going through there and they were riding pretty fast but they didn't, couldn't, couldn't recognize who they were so somehow we tend to think that the people who did their mail in were from uh, this upper country and uh, that isn't in Rolf or John Rolf Burr's book for the old West stayed young but that is essentially what happened and I told my father and my uncles and old guy McMurray, the cowboy that used to hang up here quite a lot. In fact, Paul mentioned Guy McMurray in, in some of his writings. Guy used to stay at our cow camp on Blue Mountain when I was about a 16, 17 year old kid. And now Guy gave me lots of advice, and it's not the kind that I would appreciate or telling you, and I won't. But uh, Guy was somewhat of a character too. 
when they first got the railroad in up here at Peter, there was no yards on down here to load cattle. They trailed cattle up from Blue Mountain, and Guy was with the cowboys who were trailing those cattle. And when you're trailing cattle to the railroad, you only go six or eight miles a day. You just keep them grazing in one direction. Well, when they got up here out on 20 Mile Park, Guy said he wanted to be horse wrangler at night. And so he, uh, they said, all right, so he uh, took the horses in. Next morning he had them back there at daylight, but he was drunk. They couldn't figure out how he did that. So the next night some of the cow cowboys, they didn't really go to bed, and they came in and Guy was over here in the joints in Brooklyn, but he had the horses back the next morning. <laughs> and nobody knew how he kept those horses together at night. And a few days later, somebody passed away here in the community. The only fenced place was the cemetery out here. That's where Guy grew the horses at night. He, he said they were somewhere confronting me, he says, those Cowboys, those old fellas laying under that sod, they're not going to care about those horses eating that tall grass above them. And so that actually happened. It's never been documented in any history books, but it actually happened. And that's something about that. Now, we've talked about getting rid of a sheep herder, the forceful way, but there was also some very good sheepmen in this area. I think that Greek people who came here from the old country were well schooled in running livestock, especially sheep, in Greece. Because when you think of the Theus family, or the Perulus family, or the Papulus family, or any of the others, Nereantha here is a Greek girl too. So <laughs> yeah. they, she could probably speak a lot on that, but some of the very best sheep men were primarily the, the Greek people who came here. I, I could go on quite a while on different Greek families and so on, but Marsha gave me the signal two minutes, so thank you, I'm done. <laughs> going to present to you this evening is C.J. Mucklow. And C.J. was an extension agent here for quite a while as well. We've asked him to talk on, um, you know, it doesn't matter what I ask C.J. to talk on because he's going to talk about whatever he wants to do. <laughs> so, C.J. Mucklow. <laughs> I found the 19, uh, 19, 1918 Extension Annual Report. And the first county agent here in 1918 was a guy named J.C. Hale. And he was here about three years. And he had several priorities. One was going to Wisconsin by encouraging bulls. One was controlling Wyoming ground squirrels. We only quit that in the 90s, so you know. <laughs> the third one was um, raising spring wheat. And the other was improved grass varieties. So it's, I've got it all right here. So. And I have the number of cows, the number of sheep. Um, the rural population was 4,000. Total population was 80, 8,500 in Brown County. So anyway, the number one thing that J.C. Hale did in 1918, 1919 was to organize farmers in the groups called the Farm Bureau. Not the same Farm Bureau of today. That's a, an organization that's now more political. But his whole intention was to organize farmers to have educational events throughout the major agricultural areas of the county. And according to him, they are uh, Yampa, Sydney, Troll, Clark, and Hayden. So, um, and I uh, think that's kind of interesting. One of the things that uh, I did when I first came here is um, help organize uh, cooperative efforts too. In the, in the early '90s, there was a lot of a lot of dissension in the Western United States about. Um, 
cattle and, and livestock and logging. A lot of people just thought those things were really bad. Things like cattle free by 93. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> so one of the nice things, in my opinion, about living in Steamboat Springs is that people were a little more apt to try to work together. And one of the things we did um, in about 93 was we formed this group called the Echo Ag Group. We had, we had representation from the cattlemen, the wool growers, a developer, a county commissioner, the Sierra Club, a land trust, um, and we did nothing but sit around and talk um, and realize there's a lot more in common than there was not. Now, we did not talk about wool for introduction because we did not agree on that, okay? But we found out there was a lot more that we could do. And what this group did in the end did only one thing, and it doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. I don't think anybody was here. Gary Codswell, Nancy Stahoviak. Um, what we did do is write a letter to the editor saying, you know what, we to sit down and talk to people and have a lot more in common with things. So let's sit down and talk to them and not, and not say things like Cattle Free by 93 or, and do that. So we put, we put that little editorial so we, we could work together. And some, some of the things that have come from that, it wasn't just from this group, there's a lot of people like Marcia and a ton of other folks. But we did a lot of things like forming the community ag alliance, so one of the reasons you're here tonight. The Purchase of Development Right program turned into be a group effort that shared a lot of those visions. So, anyway, I just, uh, that's about what I really had. Uh, just some other fun things um, from 1919. Uh, the number one crop was clover and Timothy hay. Um, wheat was second. That wouldn't be true today. Alfalfa would be second. And then wheat, oats, and barley. Uh, we had um, a thousand farms according to the census. According to the census today, we have more farms than that. That's because how we count them. We count everything with 35 acres or more as a farm. We have to look at the number of really commercially viable farms, probably down to about 100 or fewer. Um, horses, there were 5,624 horses in Rock County. There were 45,267 cattle. That's pretty close to what we have today, but I'm not sure what they mean by their definitions. Dairy cattle, there were 8,790. I don't know how many were herbal cold seeds and how many were herbal Hogs, 2,165. And sheep, this is the one that's really dropped. And I'm assuming this is year-round sheep. There were 50,446 that is sheep. So in Rock County today, there's fewer than 1,000 year-round sheep. Um, but in the summertime, we still run more sheep than any place in the United States, running about 70,000 heads. So I'm not sure how they count. Anyway, that's about what I have. If you got any questions, we're happy to answer for it. And, um, uh, oh, and oats and peas. Is that cheap by about county in the summertime? This figure? 70,000, is that? I, I'm assuming that's year-round sheep, but I'm not positive, Paul. I'm assuring that there was a lot more sheep here in the 50s, and I believe that close to the 50,000 year-round sheep, maybe Sam would know. But we certainly don't have a thousand head of ewes left year-round in Rock County. We have a lot of them on forts, but I don't know how many we have. I don't know how many we would have had in say, World War II, and it's 50,000 is pretty steady. And the other part about this is the agriculture economy went from about you know, 50, 60% of the economy in the 20s and 30s to less than 1% of the economy today. So I'll quit there because I haven't got the flash yet, but I can see that it is coming. <laughs> so thank you. numbers funny on the sheep is all of those herds from north of us that trail down the high country and some are on rabbit ears and farther south and go back to Rawls and that area uh, to winter. And there you can still see the relics of those old shearing corrals along the Union Pacific Railroad. All you gotta do is fly it in a light airplane and just Every few miles, you can see where the shearing corrals were if they're not still there. Because there's a lot more greasewood, a lot more sagebrush, and a lot less grass, because they just brought those herds in close to those shearing corrals and pretty much ate anything that they could. But the, that number, Vern Vivian, the year that he was president of National Wool Growers, he owned that land just on the east side of Rabbit Ears Pass where that old log cabin is. 
the, the one thing I wanted to add to is, is the long business the family business in Robert County is a ranch, and it goes back to 1870 and happens to be the Salisbury Ranch in the Little Snake. That's the longest owned family business in Robert County. And one of the most beautiful, Jim. And they run sheep too, sheep and cows. Thank you, CJ. Our next speaker this evening is Todd Kalu, and he is our youngest representative on this panel, but definitely one of the most smartest. We are so, so fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Have Todd in our county leading us in agricultural issues now. So Todd uh, is going to visit a little bit about some of the new things that are happening with uh, with heritage agriculture. Todd, thank you, Marcia. Uh, I think it's interesting as, as we talk about the history here, uh, really tying that into what's going on now. And back in the time when Rita's family was was homesteading, uh, or my family was homesteading here, people would get there their homestead, and it, their goal was to increase the size of the properties. So they try to get enough money to buy the next homestead. Or dad would homestead park, or mom would go homestead another um, 160. So people were really trying to grow. And back in 1919, CJ's talking about that first report, that ag agent was going out and helping people figure out how to manage larger landscapes and larger landscapes. I think that's probably true through Sam's tenure locked in, in extension. Certainly what CJ and I have seen the last several years, uh, last couple decades, is that those large ranches are now getting smaller again. And one of the things that I find I get to do most often is uh, help our new neighbors uh, figure out what they can actually do with their five acres, their 20 acres, or the 35 acres. Um, and certainly I think that's a little different than, than what Extension did in the past. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, like this week, we're doing a range management workshop on Thursday. So we're still talking about large landscape um, level management. Um, we still partner with U.S. Forest Service and BLM and NRCS on those conversations. But the majority of my time when I'm doing site visits is visiting with folks that have just moved into the area and they have five or 10 acres and they also think that five or 10 acres can run 20 cows. <laughs> How many of you have seen that? And people, people say, well, gosh, don't you hate going out to those places? I say, no, I love going out to those places because those are the people we need to be having the conversation with about what can we really expect this land to produce. Um, so I think that, that has been an interesting shift. And what I also think is, um, some of you may know that uh, Bobby and Lane Gay were my grandparents. And they certainly were well known through the 80s and 90s in, in their uh, steadfast commitment to agriculture in the Yampa Valley and uh, to having the conversation about how do we as a community want to grow. Certainly CJ um, and Sam were part of those conversations. Um, so were Dean and Rita and, and many of you. Uh, what I think is interesting is I get to know all the people that are moving in is they have, for the most part, the same value system that we do. They love the same things we do. They love this land as much as we do. They just maybe don't always know how to put that love um, to work for them in a positive way for their land. So that's one of the things that we really we truly, really try to do through our workshops and how we're, we're working in extension. Um, is, is share, sharing our love and making sure that they love their land in appropriate ways. Uh, I think it was interesting, CK mentioned that uh, that 1919 report, the extension agent was working on ground squirrels. I have a call that I got today that I need to call about why we ground squirrels. So we're still dealing with that 100 years later. Spring wheat, um, you know, we are still a wheat producing county. A lot of people forget that we still have farms here. Um, we're not just about livestock, even though you can, as CJ likes to remind us, put more pounds on a, a yearling um, bovine critter here in the summer than you can anywhere else. But you know, west of here, we still have some really good farm country. But we're doing research right now uh, through the university in partnership with the Conservation District and NRCS to figure out how we can get alternative crops in the rotation with wheat that not only improves the farmer's bottom line in dollar, but also rebuilds soil. So, you know, those research projects that were important 100 years ago are important now, but we've got a little twist on things. How do we get back to the land so the kids in 100 years can talk fondly about what we did? 
Because we need to remember that Cameron and her kids that are her age and some of them do out there, that we are responsible for the history today that they'll be discussing on panels tomorrow. So thank you all for being here tonight. I look forward to your questions. Tell you, I have never been in a room where extension agents talk so little. <laughs> okay, with that, what we're going to do is open this up to questions. I'm sure that many of you have some, some really good questions, and what an excellent panel. Um, you know, I was thinking just a second ago. On Friday evening, uh, Ago Lennons and the Art Steve of Arts Council are sponsoring a dance over at the depot, calling it a community bar dance. And I know every one of these people, and their, their partners, their spouses, have danced miles and miles and miles in this county. And maybe that's what kept them so young. So for those of you that don't think you should get out and dance, we'd like to see you Friday night over at the depot. Um, with that, uh, Lewis. If you would stand and, and kind of shout loud enough so we don't have to repeat the question. How many cattle do you figure you can uh, run on a How many cattle It's how many acres per cow. You need to, that, there you go. You need to turn that question around. And it, this is this is why I'm employed, Lewis. Because um, it depends. It is, very variable in this county. It's variable on everybody's property. It depends on how much water you've got, which way the slope faces, what you've got planted there, if it's oak, that's an alkaline slope with a bunch of mules here on it, or whether it's prime bottom land. So uh, I, I think, we, you know, typical range, two to three acres per animal unit, uh, but that is very variable. I don't know who might want to argue that. I, uh, I, I want to argue that a little bit because Bob McGraw County at one time were all one county. The very west end of that particular county is where we were. We had one school section we had rented from the state. We figured the carrying capacity on that was for the summer. Essentially from the 1st of May to the 1st of November was 35 men on 640 acres. Okay, another question. Dennis, uh, would you stand, please? Okay. Well, you guys represent a fantastic legacy <coughs> of homesteaders who came to this fantastic valley first, I guess, and captured up this land and worked it and made it your own. And now, generations later, you guys are talking about it. Can you give us a sense for, were there other folks right behind you coming along, wanting the same thing? Were, like the Sooners in Oklahoma, who once the Olmstead Act was declared, they were already there. But in, in the Yampa Valley, with cattle ranching and sheep ranching, was there a sense that we're here now and you other folks have to move on or not? Dean, would you address that first? <laughs> I didn't quite understand all that. My hair isn't that good. Uh, I imagine there is a lot of people. There's a lot of people around here now that uh, would like to go into the ranching industry, and some of them would like to expand what they got. But to be full time anymore is uh, it costs some dollars. Yeah. I would. Is it on now? Yeah. Um, I would address that somewhat. The uh, first homesteaders that came in came in right after the Utes were moved. Uh, no, well, I'll qualify that even a little. Uh, the north end of the valley was open before. That's why the Crawfords came in before. But the south end of the county was still part of the Ute Reservation. And when the Utes were 
uh, moved into Utah and the Southern Reservations in Colorado, the, uh, they opened the area up for homesteading. Uh, the bottom lands were taken at that time. Uh, the Moffat, what's now Moffat County, was uh, settled by a lot of the large cattle ranches. And it all happened at just about the same time. And that's one reason why there was the dispute between the cattle and sheep. That's also one reason why the south end of the valley was a lot smaller place and why it was settled, and you were talking about the roles of women on a ranch. The women were partners to the men in a lot of times because there were no iron hands. And as far as somebody coming in behind them, uh, there was a lot of the sagebrush land, a lot of the land down in Moffat County that they tried to settle and turn into homesteads. And it's not productive enough to run and keep a family alive on 160 acres. It just can't be done. And the the not the way not with the type of uh, substance subsistence that they had at that time. The uh, people were still homesteading up until about 1930 here in Rock County. And it. Uh, They sold when they would prove up. A lot of times, the only reason they were here was to make enough money that they could sell to a neighbor and they could go back someplace else to perhaps where they come from or went on. That was enough money for them to live again for a while. That answer your question? Yes, thank you. CJ, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I think she okay. Um, if you get a chance before you get out of here, be sure to come over and visit with Dennis. He brought in a picture of sheep being trailed down, is it 7th Street. Seventh Street here in Steamboat, it's still a dirt road, uh, and it's a great picture, so come take a look at it. There's another question over here. There you are. Okay. Um, Dean, I was wondering uh, what caused the end of the dairy business in Rock County? <clears throat> well, the end of the dairy business was when the North County Creamery said that we had to dry log our cattle and uh, chop or feed hay in enclosed areas. We all had to put in bulk tanks and uh, pipeline melters and just modernize everything. And that's the main reason all the ranchers decided to sell out to one guy and he put a major dairy in down in the Moffat County area. When was that? That would have been about 1963 or 4. Thank you. Jackie. I'm sorry. Would you stand up? Okay. I have forgotten that the Luke family had a dairy operation. How many cow, cows did you milk at that time? And I want to know who did the milking. <laughs> 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 well, Dale and I, when we got the milking down, we got to go run down the river and go fishing. So he would run the milk machines, and I'd milk five or six or seven. So you had milking machines at that time. Yeah. Okay. But they what they wanted us to go to a pipeline milk machine, which we had the last two or three years. But uh, I think the dry milk and the cattle, and then green chopping all your feed, bringing it in. Is what stopped most of it. But on average, how many cows did you milk a day? We milked on an average approximately 25. Yeah. And then up the valley, I think Carol Harvey had about, he was milking about 15 a day. Mike, I don't know, probably, probably the same. Did your sister and your mother milk cows? Yes, they questioned her time she I was raised on a ranch with four brothers, and no male in the shared family ever milked a cow. Oh. <laughs> so I was just checking to see. <laughs> As you drive up the Oak River Valley, you'll see those barns. Most of them are made out of the cement blocks. 
uh, looks happens to be painted red, correct? Red. It's red. red. And then the one on uh, Gilbert's place is uh, it's still gray. So you kind of pick them out as you go up. You'll see them. Is there another question? Yes, Liza. I have a question about the, when the farming really started and winter wheat and when all of that kind of happened, especially around kind of the Hayden area when a lot of that country was broken out into farming and wheat. I don't have the exact date, but it would have been after the turn of the century, and that was the, that was the extensive effort of the extension office to really to really farm that. Um, so it was homestead. The homestead, like we just said, were really subsistence farms are just barely getting by, and they would break out that ground with the effort to sort of raise a higher value crop. I can think it's really about higher value crops, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so it was right after the turn of the century, the twenties and thirties, and then began to see government policy change. Actually, he had an increase in, in uh, Brown farm acres up until about the 50s or 60s, and so it levels off. And then you have this program called CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. And the 1980 Farm Bill, which put a lot of it back to grass, and now it got back. So we, the one time we had 30 or 40,000 acres of Brown farm ground, and now we're less than 15,000, 10,000? We used to have 6,000 acres in our county that's been farmed. Yeah, it's probably way down. So. Um, Diane Holly is back here. Her grandfather and his brother were the first ones to bring up the farm. <coughs> Diane? I'm just going to speak to that because I'm truly a farm girl first. Louder, please. I'm truly a farm girl first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my grandfather had pictures of horse drawn. Uh, what's it called? The pressure? Yeah, yeah. The cutter bar that does the sheaves out. Oh, it's the, binder. the binder. Thank you. Horse drawn binder in the 20s. And then the threshing machines that were steam operated, and all the families would get together. And all the families got together and threshed grain until they were done in that part of the valley. So my dad in the 60s, 50s and 60s, farm wheat, barley, and oats on 300 acres. So if we had no hail, we had good rain, I got good school clothes. <laughs> I could recount the times. I never really connected why I had good school clothes one year and my cousin's clothes the next year. <laughs> but just like CJ said, in the, when it came in 1979, 1980, aging farmer in his 50s, broken down equipment, Fighting all that, the government said, we'll pay you not to farm. And he signed up. Yeah. <laughs> also, just a little bit of history on the kitchens. When the, when the older folks harvested their grain, they had much more than what they knew what to do with. And they literally put it behind a team of horses in a wagon and drove to Wallens, Wyoming for the market. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Next question. Yeah. yeah. I think we should add real quick that, that Liza asked about when people started farming in West Route. All this country was farmed. There was grain growing up the Elk River, up the Gander River, everywhere. That's now a lot of pasture, alfalfa, etc. Those those were broke out and turned into grain crops. People had oats for their horses and wheat for home and barley for the chickens and you know made it made mix up. We still do a variety of test plot here for wheat. So that does have good issue. And uh, in several of the uh, museums, you will see uh, uh, threshing machines, or as the old timers call them, separators, yep. that were pulled around the county. And my dad and my grandfather both pulled separators on the south end of the county. And they were uh, separating one year well after Thanksgiving, because the uh, uh, homesteaders, the farmers, would stack their uh, wheat or oats or barley in small stacks with the, and then would the people that owned the threshing machines then would go from farm to farm and uh, thresh the stacks. Yeah. Rhea, while well, you have the mic, do you want to talk a little bit about the spinach and lettuce industries? Yes, uh, <laughs> I can do that. Um, the lettuce industry on the uh, south end of the county 
was quite large. It started in about 1920 or 21, and uh, got quite, it started out with one farmer, and he mailed his lettuce on the train uh, out to Denver and made a huge profit uh, for that time. So the next year, as you can well guess, a lot of the other people in the area uh, did the same thing. And they didn't send it by mail. Uh, then they started shipping it uh, freight on the trains. And uh, up to and including uh, by 1930, they had a good ice sheds between Yampa and Tabonis. And they would put ice in the boxcars and some of that lettuce went as far as New York City. Uh, Route County uh, lettuce was featured uh, at the Waldorf, or, uh, Ster uh, Waldorf Astoria uh, hotel chain. So uh, it was very viable for a few years. There was many reasons, and you'll find some argument on why that uh, um, did not happen any longer than it did. There were a few people that kept raising lettuce up into the 1950s, uh, and I think a couple of components, but the majority of it went to uh, Spanish, and Jack Holton and Tabonis was probably the last one that shipped that out by train. The uh, reason that a lot of the others did not do it anymore is because uh, California could do it so much cheaper because their labor was a lot cheaper. And lettuce is a very labor-intensive crop. Uh, Margaret Rossi uh, has a quote of saying that it paid off their place by raising lettuce, but it was a stooped labor for everyone involved, and she was one of the ones involved. There again, the women were partners. They did the hard labor just as much as the men did. Uh, something else that Brown County had, and you hear about Strawberry Park here in Steve but the, around the south end of the valley raised strawberries for sale also. I want to add to that a little bit. <laughs> Maybe sometimes there's an advantage to get bold. <laughs> we had a binder at the ranch, and I know how to shop grain, I know how to stack it. My dad taught me how to stack it. And you didn't care whether it rained, because he, he could stack those bundles, and they wouldn't slide out, and yet the stack would, would shed rain. Now you couldn't thrash, for the first three days that you had the grain in the stack because the grain went through a sweat. You had to let that sweat time go by. Uh, we didn't own a thrash machine, but your dad had one in the bar. Does he still, is it still out there? No, it was so a few years ago. An antique people came it was, <laughs> it was a beautiful little separator because he showed it to me and it was the first class shape. Really in good shape. Uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, how you put grain up. The main reason the Haslam family stacked it and thrashed it, we were in the cattle business. And if you had a straw stack, you got the straw and the chaff, which was a good feed. I mean, it would, you could keep that alive and they wouldn't go downhill. And we certainly wanted to have that straw stack and we had our, our hay wagons and we had two of them rigged with a net wire around us so we could put up every fall for what we probably uh, use the, the straw to feed the cattle. We'd, we'd be kind of kind to the cattle. One day they got straw, the next day they got alfalfa hay. But it didn't matter which day it was, they came a running for it. Well, I'll tell you one thing, because I helped put together a super train of cattle from this area to Omaha. We, we had those big, long, 95-foot cars, 
that even had water troughs in them so that you could water the cattle or the siding. But the railroad was much rather hauled coal. There's that, they, they don't have to clean the car out like you had to after you hauled cattle or so on. But the railroad worked with us when we put that super, super car program together to go to Omaha. And uh, we loaded the cattle here at, at uh, Stebo. We loaded them at Yampa. And we loaded cattle at Glenwood and Kremlin on that train. But those were big cars, and they would hold a lot of, a lot of euros. And uh, we had a lot of participation. It was a good program. Uh, as far as the sheepmen and the cattle were getting along together, a heck of a lot of them raised both species. I'm just thinking of when we started up the valley, Dan Nott had a good Columbia sheep. He had also had some good cattle. Uh, all the way down, there was, we had a low pool here. There's our old Bedell right here. He was in the low pool, and he's a cattleman also. And uh, uh, a lot of people had both cattle and sheep, Chuck Fulton and Hayden. And I could. Stetson. I, uh, Stetson. Frank Stetson. Frank Stetson. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, Stetson, absolutely. But don't you add, right? Unless she grew in a tertiary. No, that's a myth. That's a myth. So what they used to say they crop it down on the old in the old time when cattle guys used to say those sheep to crop the grass so short that the cattle couldn't graze, but that's never was that's not true. So actually the reality is if you have a you want to have a the old saying you want to have a great cattle ranch, start with sheep because they'll eat all the browse and have more grass. So you want to have a great cattle ranch, start with sheep grass. Back in World War II, and I can talk about that because I was old enough to know what went on. The sheepmen in World War II, the wool paid their expenses, and the lamb sales was all profit. See, all of our military uniforms in World War II were wool. And there was the wool market was real good. In fact, what year? It got so high that the wool bars advanced a bunch of money to people. Then the market went south, and then there were a lot of guys bought a new pickup or something else, had to cough up quite a chunk of change because the wool market had headed south. Uh, I would like to, to talk just a little more about that uh, cattle and sheep. Uh, there was actual cattle wars and sheep wars but it was early, it was in uh, 1912, 14, something like that. And then again, I believe in 1920, was the last settlement. Those early cowboys did not want the sheep in. Uh, and to uh, get back to you, Sam, on that, uh, where did those cowboys come from? Uh, there is an article in the paper, one of the early Brown County papers, that said a lot of the cowboys from the Yampa Oak Creek area uh, got together and rode down to join the cowboys from Steamboat and Hayden to go down and meet that, those herds of cattle and uh, herds of sheep. And they were going to, they set the boundary on the Colorado Wyoming border and the Colorado Utah border. So the cattle sheep wars were early in the uh, history of Rock County. By, uh, the World War II, it wasn't as much. Well, even by the 1930s, it wasn't as much. Although my dad was a was a sheep man, uh, Francis Moore, and lived uh, in Yampa. The uh, he trailed some sheep up the river road, which is uh, what we call a river road. It goes up towards Crochet Lake, and he had a permit up on the flat tops, and. Uh, uh, the article in the paper at that time said that, that the kid that was helping push those sheep up was told to be very careful to keep the sheep on the road and not let them get off into the cattleman's uh, ground on the way up. So there was still some dissension even at that time. Uh, on up to when I was in school as a kid in the 50s, and yes, I'm dating myself quite handily, 
Uh, the uh, uh, differences between the cattle and sheep were still felt then. I was a sheep herder's daughter. I was not a cowboy. Uh, it wasn't until I married my cowboy that, that I became a cowboy. <laughs> yes. Good evening. Um, I guess just a question with being from the, some of the up and coming generation, what some of your hopes would be to see what could happen here from an agricultural perspective moving forward? Well, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> well, um, I've worked on most of my whole life, so I'd like to see agriculture stay. I, this is truly one of the greatest grazing environments in North America in the summertime. It's not so hot in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> but you can put more gains on livestock here. June, July, or September, you can't almost any place in the country. So I would like to make sure we keep livestock here. I think it's a really beneficial thing at no cost, no inputs. So I'd like to see agriculture stay. I think it's kind of fun to have the local food thing back, but also we've got to be a realist and say, you know, it's, some of that's just plain hard work. Milking cows is hard work. And raising hogs, I'm not sure it's the best place to raise hogs, or it's the best place to raise certain grains. So we really got to be smart about the agriculture that we do have, because I'm not sure it all fits in this environment. But I enjoy, if we take agriculture back to a gardening level where profit is not a motivation, it's fun. I have a ball raising pumpkins for the hell of it. To say you can't, because Todd told me I couldn't, so I can't do it. And I mean, it's fun, but I, I just I think we have to be really thoughtful about how we do that. So, yeah, I want to see that diversity come back. We can raise potatoes here, root crops. I'd like to see that diversity stay, but I think the greatest part about agriculture here is running livestock. That's just my opinion. So, fire away. I say one time I was out there uh, working in my garden and Jack had come by and she hollered down her, you can buy it a lot cheaper than at the farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> Sam? I'd just wanted to make a comment about the strawberry industry that was, was raised here and they were very quality, high quality berries uh, were on display at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver and so on. Uh, a lot of you people probably didn't know that Ray Sprindle was county agent here at that time. His son Jack Sprindle tended strawberry plots, which are where the courthouse annex is now. But when Jack Sprindle was a kid, he tended strawberry plots that his dad had, experimental plots, right behind the courthouse. And uh, uh, so, <laughs> I, I, I've known a number of the old county agents, Bob Hamill, who was here uh, before Bill Coffey. Bob is deceased now. You probably read that in the paper. We lost Bob, who's a a good guy. I said, boy, you know, Bob Hamill, a good guy. I said, well, a good guy. <laughs> but uh, Bob uh, worked many years as junior livestock show superintendent at National Western Stock Show. In fact, I worked under him for a number of years in the junior livestock department at National Western Stock Show. Then Bill Coffey, who was here before me, went to Rock Springs, Wyoming, and I, I have no idea what Bill's doing now. Uh, I did go up there one year to judge the sheep show at the fair. He was still there, but uh, I haven't been back since. And uh, I, I, I have known ever agent since me, and I think you've been fortunate to have some real good ones. When I hear somebody tell me the CJ's better had than you were, I paid attention. Todd, would you address the issue? Yeah, I will talk, because Brittany is one of our up-and-coming uh, young agriculturalists, as she said. You know, I think it's really exciting that we have this, this energy about people wanting to grow their own food and want to know where their food comes from. And I think back to the, uh, the early 30s when my grandmother's father tended a huge garden out uh, at Bruce Creek, and they grew 1,500 cabbages that they sold at the local Safeway store. And they grew berries, and they grew uh, lettuce and spinach, and the things we're really good at, right? Because you know as a master gardener, we do cool season crops really well. Um, you know, and it's amazing to me that, that 
90 years ago, it was a lot easier to get your produce in the local grocery store. They were seeking you out because they wanted local produce. And I see that happening again. And you know, the Ag Alliance doing their community uh, marketplace, the farmer's market having success with the actual one really good farmer's stand. Um, I think it's exciting that people are excited about it. And I think we need to remember too that we have a different clientele in Steamboat Springs than we used to. So when Jackie yelled, you can get that for cheaper at the store, she was right, but we also have a lot of people moving into this community who are willing to pay top dollar, and that makes that backbreaking work a little more worth it when you're actually getting paid for it. And I think we've got to take advantage of that. And if I could put a plug in on Todd's comment here, for those of you that do want to buy local food, uh, Community Ag Alliance now has an online market that you can go to, and uh, we have 35 different producers that are bringing in everything from four different kinds of meats, including rabbits, down to honey, to eggs. We have lots of eggs. Could use some more if any of you have eggs would like to put on there. Very simple process. But if you're looking for local foods, please go on there and take a look at what is it we have offered right now. Rita. Yeah, I would like to to just make a real short comment on that same same direction. Uh, the local foods, those, I brought a couple of pictures. Those women that grew those gardens back in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, grew enough that they could trade with the local grocer and uh, uh, get something that they couldn't grow in this area. And those, they had big gardens. And they had garden skirts. <laughs> no, no, no. Here's okay, good. Paul. Paul. I have a question. I have a question here. It's a little bit different. But uh, one of the things that's helped agriculture nationally here, as well as everything else, is the improvement in the breeds and how we breed our livestock. So now as a kid, if you ship the calves at 350 pounds, which is as cash. If it's not 550 pounds now, it's not very big cash. And the reason for it is the breeding that has taken place much of it. And a lot of that is the result of things that started back, I'm not sure when, Buber uh, said I talked about it in the 1920s, of uh, you folks, the farm agents, uh, and encouraging them to go to registered cattle. Now, we had a lot of registered bull herds here in Ralph County, up until, primarily Herbert, until in the 1960s or 70s. One of you guys, all of you people like to comment on uh, the registered cattle business and the improvement in bloodlines we had. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump into it. I, I might be the half light or fourth light or so on. One of the stockmen who probably caused more frost and did more work for the herder people than anybody alive was Farrington R. Carpenter. Ferry Carpenter uh, was well educated. He had a BS degree from Princeton and a Harvard Law degree. Just another little side note, <laughs> he was the first director of what we call the BLM now, and that was the Federal Lands, the Grazing Service, and the title then was the Grazing Service. My dad was on one of the first boards. They divided the West up into 11 grazing districts, and Ferry tried like the devil to get dad to go to work for him, running one of the grazing districts. And my dad was a little set in his ways, a bit bullheaded and pretty tall man. He stood 6'4". He said, no, Perry, I want to run the ranch. And he did, and, but uh, we still bought bulls from Ferry Carpenter. In fact, uh, we got the last bull from Ferry Carpenter when I was in the service in the Air Force in 1953 or 54. Because I remember that last Carpenter bull. He was a very good bull. But Ferry is one of the guys who started the record keep on weeding weights and, and things like that. And he had a hard time getting some of the 
purebred Hereford breeders to practice that because they had not beat not Hereford type. They they damn near type the Hereford breed out of business along in the 30s and early 40s, little compressed cattle. And yet they were still selling, selling cattle by the pound. But uh, that was one of the things. Now some of the former agents here did some real good things on selection of cattle. Bill Culberson was excellent, did a lot of it. We called it ROP work, Record of Production work. In fact, the first time that I met John Fetcher, Bill Culberson had taken John Fetcher to CSU, and John Fetcher was an electrical engineer, his brother was a chemical engineer. And they had made a real interesting way of selecting replacements and which calves to cull and which to keep. They mixed up a chemical deal that was very bright red and they just walked, rode around in the herd of cows and had the calves separated from the cows and they sprayed the cattle's faces with that red dye. I remember John Fetcher, and this was quite a few years ago, I remember John Fetcher saying that uh, you damn near had to throw the sap away when you got done because his brother, who was a chemical engineer, made a real potent deal that stained everything. Then they turned the calves back to the cows, and uh, the calves that they had barked was a real good one, so all they had to do was call the cows out by the order. That's all they had to do. No records at all. But that was just one of the early things that was done in cattle selection here. CJ, did you have something? Okay. We'll take one more question and then we will stop. Hey, uh, I'd like to sum this one message at all here today was uh, my mother's folks, they come here in 1880 and homesteaded on Big Creek over here. And, uh, one time they was rock masons. They was farmers too from Missouri. But uh, took a walk with my uncle one time at the cemetery up here. And he was showing me all the graves that they'd uh, built heads or headstones and stuff around. And during the 1990, when the flu epidemic came, a lot of sad things happened in this country. Quite a few people died. Uh, Doc Willett told me one time that uh, they made a, like a kerosene smudge for People that had the flu epidemic, that flu, that's where we had penicillin. He said, hell, we killed more of them than we cured. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. My mother was named after him, and I was named after Dr. Willett. So my family has a lot of history here in this county, too. My, grand, my grandparents, homestead, they didn't homestead, but they lived in Hans Peak, and they come here in 1919. They used to come to a steamboat to get groceries and they stayed with Dean's mother folks. The kiddies there stayed all night there, come to the steamboat, get their groceries, go back up there. Next day, go back to Hans Beat. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was. We got a lot of history in this room tonight. Um, well, let's see. I think that uh, we need to sing happy birthday, not only to Dean, but also to Sam for celebrating that. Uh, birthday and a little bit of time and then not today but in a few days uh, so let's uh let's uh sing this and then we'll break up and you can have a cup of coffee and a piece of cake and thank you for coming